Thank you very much, uh, Madam, Excellencies, Ambassadors, Member of Parliament, uh, dear guests, colleagues. Let me join the Ambassador in, of course, uh, paying a tribute and con congratulating the uh, organizers for organizing this uh, important and, of course, very timely conference. But as a matter of politeness, uh, maybe just a few words about the OECD, just to mention who we are. Uh, for the one or two people in the room that would not know what the OECD is, maybe more than one or two, we are a Paris-based international institution based on a treaty uh, which was underwritten in 1961. We currently have uh, 34 member states, globally from Canada, the US to Australia, and from Chile to, uh, to South Korea. We tend to uh, try to bring together all let's say, developed uh, economies, industrialized economies in the world. We uh, represent globally 50% uh, of the added value produced um, in the world. It's fair to say that last July, for the first time in world history, the emerging economies produced more than the mature economies. But still, OECD is about uh, economies, about social cohesion, and we are working in, um, in Paris. We, we have lots of... Uh, uh, candidates, member states, we have uh, some 2,700 economists working at our headquarters. Very important uh, few things, uh, often mistaken. The E in OECD doesn't relate to Europe because lots of people think that we are a European institution. We are a very typical transatlantic, now a global institution, but we were uh, designed as a uh, transatlantic institution. Um, with the purpose of governing in a more uh, rational way the so-called Marshall money, which was coming from the US to the uh, European uh, countries, which was uh, put at the disposal of the governments after the Second World War by the American authorities. Second uh, thing to underline, uh, important aspect, characteristic of our work, and it's important also to understand what uh, our interaction is with the topic, the subject of this morning, is that we have uh, no power to um, make legally binding decisions. We have lots of treaties, for instance, in taxation, trying to tackle uh, tax havens, for instance, but we have no uh, legally binding power. We try to have sometimes some more uh, authority. So coming to the subject, I think it's fair to say that the need to cooperate, that the need to work together on common international global approaches to the internet has, in fact, I think, indeed, never been greater than today. It's very clear that the uh, current, um, quite informally grown, current arrangements for internet governments and, and, uh, and policy making have indeed come under very severe pressure due to the NSA case, but also, for instance, due to um, often occurring data security breaches. Um, what is indeed at stake, we think, at OECD is the open, decentralized character of the Internet, as well as, and this is very important, and it's the basis, we think, for its success, the so-called uh, multi-stakeholder model of governments that has helped to make the internet um, fundamentally important for our economy and societies, the multi-stakeholder governance, putting on the same table the public authority, but also representatives of the economy, the industry, and the civil society. And what we have to do is to strike a good balance between, on the one hand, the possibilities, the uh, enormous capacities of the internet to, um, to raise the um, effectiveness and efficiency of our economy on the one hand, and on the other hand, the uh, need um, for more effective and efficient protection of uh, some common values like the privacy, like um, uh, protection of privacy, like consumer protection, like security. Ladies and gentlemen, I of course do uh, intend to address the quite provocative topic of this panel, and I quote, cyberspace as the Wild West. But I don't want to keep you under suspense. Uh, at the OECD, we do not see the Internet as creating a kind of new post-territorial world order. But before I uh, elaborate on that, before I cover that, I would like to recall why questions about governance and 
policy making for the internet are on the one hand so important today, but on the other hand, it is very important to address them in the right way. Uh, lots, the stakes are very, very high. And I will close with a few suggestions about how we can work together to ensure uh, that the fundamental uh, infrastructure can continue to bring the economic and social benefits on which we are now uh, dependent. But first of all, let's um, once again put forward the enormous impact of internet on our lives, on our economies. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, uh, over the last two decades, the breakthrough of internet dating from, let's say, 90. 1995, 1998, well, that internet, the internet has radically changed our economies and our lives. Today, billions of people around the world have access to online information and are literally connected to one another in ways that are more and more innovative. And this is, we think, just the beginning. Wireless connectivity now links objects people, of course, but also objects like GPS devices, vehicles, streetlights, and so on. And this is leading to new interconnected systems that underpin our economic development and that can help countries to achieve important economic and social goals. Some of our experts in Paris expect the so-called Internet of Things. This Internet of Things to connect approximately 50 billion mobile wireless devices by 2020. And of course, the ambassador has underlined it, uh, concepts like borders, like national sovereignty and so on are challenged by, and distance also are challenged by uh, the internet. And these concepts were basic, fundamental for uh, building our democracies, building our regulatory systems and so on. The positive side of the story once again is that the internet benefits individuals with a um, very much enlarged variety of digital goods and services, with lower prices and so more disposable income, with a more efficient labor market and improvements in the environment, health and education. It benefits businesses with improved efficiencies in everything from commercial services to industrial manufacturing, and it expands the global markets in a very cheap way. And as far as governments are concerned, it benefits governments, making it easier to consult and communicate with citizens, and of course, making it easier to deliver services more cheaply. Ladies and gentlemen, since the internet has uh, such a broad economic impact, measuring its impact is of course crucial, and we tend to be specialized at the OECD to, to measure, to work with figures. Well, OECD analysis suggests that up to 13% of business sector value added, for instance, in this country, in the United States, 13%, 13, which is enormous, can be attributed directly to internet-related activities. And so we're talking about a uh, system which is only 15 years old, which breakthrough is only 15 years old. Employment in the ICT sector has increased dramatically with top firms employing more than 15 million people worldwide at the end of 2011, and with a steady increase of approximately 6 to 8 percent from 2010 on in terms of employment, what makes this, um, what makes us saying that this sector, sector has weathered the crisis very well and is really a bright spot as we struggle to, co to, cover, to recover economically. So this is very important to keep in mind when we address challenges like the NSA stuff or uh, other uh, data breaches. And this confirms what policymakers have been saying for quite some time now. The internet has both been on its own a very important source of growth in a period of economic downturn and is now, as of today, a real core component of the entire world economy. It is a fundamental infrastructure in its own right. But it is very specific. It is very different to what we have known until now. Very important also, uh, taking into account what happened during the last decades in terms of social cohesion and rising inequality in our democracies, even the most egalitarian democracies tend to have a growing uh, inequality. The internet is underutilized until now, but has a lot of potential as a platform 
for inclusive social and cultural development, spurring the development and distribution of local content. Indeed, the web provides an easy means for individuals to become content creators, to develop crowdsourced knowledge bases, but also to spread education, to spread, for instance, vocational training, uh, and so on, and so on. So we think that in the long run, but policies have to adapt to these possibilities, the internet can contribute in a very important way to a more inclusive and dynamic economy, creating new tools to tackle, for instance, inequality. So the question is then, given the uh, title of your workshop, um, what is the right fashion, what are the right policies to keep this good thing, fundamentally good development, to keep it going and take more carefully into account um, the risks that have been shown during the last months. So the question uh, on the invitation is, um, cyberspace, is it the new Wild West? There's of course, ladies and gentlemen, the organizers a kind of uh, attraction to the metaphor of cyberspace as the new Wild West, a place to pursue endless opportunity for those with the courage to endure regular threats in terms of property, in terms of reputation, and even in terms of survival. After all, it is fair to say that indeed the internet today has its share of shady, what we would call snake oil salesmen and highway robbers, and it is not always obvious where to find the local sheriff, if there is any sheriff in this new Wild West. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the notion of a kind of non-territorial, post-territorial order, the internet as a new post-territorial order has roots in the internet's uh, infancy. Indeed, some early tech entrepreneurs like John Gilmore said in 93 that, and I quote, the internet interprets censorship, whatever censorship, whatever control, as damage and finds ways to root around it. A few, a few years later, in his declaration of cyberspace independence, um, a certain John Perry Berlow, a prominent cyber libertarian, called into question whatever government sovereignty and asked all governments to leave cyberspace alone. And it's fair to say that over years, governments until now have wisely exercised, exercised what I would call a measured restraint when it comes to regulating a technologically dynamic and operationally global medium like the internet. We as an OECD, we organized, in fact, the first high-level international conference ever on the internet. It was in Ottawa in 1998. And reading the outcome, the conclusions of this ministerial meeting, I found, um, above all, a kind of commitment to what was called then, I quote, a light touch regulatory approach. This is 15 years ago, Ottawa, the first big international meeting on regulation, a regulatory approach to the internet, a light touch regulatory approach. But of course, light touch, ladies and gentlemen, the organizers, does not equal Wild West. Ottawa concluded that governments should act, and I quote again the conclusions, should act where necessary to ensure adequate protection of key public interest objectives in the digital world, just as they do in the physical world. So where necessary, where necessary, and only where necessary, regulate to ensure adequate protection of key public interest objectives, not all public interest objectives in the digital world, and in a way just as they do in the physical world. We think as an OECD that this is still um, uh, the right attitude today, just applied what is applicable to also uh, the physical world. More specifically, the ministers in Ottawa in 1998 affirmed that the essential privacy and consumer protections that we expect offline already exist and apply online. The resulting Ottawa blueprint mapped out an agenda that has produced then afterwards a basic framework of policies to protect users of the internet and to foster and then I used for the first time the, the, the very important word, trust. Um, I think I, I don't need to underline that that meeting in Ottawa was a real transatlantic meeting 
the United States, Canada, and uh, the European uh, member states of OECD being at the center of these discussions. Ladies and gentlemen, let me talk now, let me speak now in a li little greater depth about two key components of the um, work on trust. Trust, which is indeed essential, which has been challenged to the bank crisis, to the financial crisis. Uh, it's what we are experiencing on the real uh, market economy and the labor market, for instance, but indeed also due to what happens to the internet. And so as our dependency on the internet increases, so too do our vulnerab vulnerabilities, making security and privacy vital, making trust in security and privacy on the internet vital. And this is an area where OECD's role as an international standard setter features prominently. There are some cornerstone uh, OECD Council recommendations in security, privacy and consumer protection. And these, as I said before, are not directly legally binding, but they form the uh, core of the national and international legislation in that field. And practice accords them great moral force as representing the political will of OECD governments. There is also a considerable body of work which is ready on dispute resolution, on enforcement cooperation, on identity management, the protection of critical information infrastructure, and a number of um, other related areas. But once again, all these, all these recommendations, drafted, discussed, debate, concluded on the level of the OECD, they uh, do not challenge fundamentally until now the basic attitude, the basic principle which was put forward in 1998 in Ottawa, that is that the existing legal framework which applies to other kinds of communication, for instance, other kinds of economic activity also applies to what's happening on the internet. And then the, 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 the most important question is how you can maintain it, how you can apply it, how you can have people, how can enforce this kind of regulation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the data security panel. So let me highlight um, one security issue, the so-called data security breach. NSA is very important. Snowden is very important, but is a matter between, um, is a problem between sovereign nations. And of course, citizens are looking at what's happening on this uh, diplomatic theater, international theater, or they're interested also um, in the outcomes. But we think that more important is uh, the problem of the so-called data security breaches, which uh, occur, um, uh, well, which number, the number of that kind of data security breaches is increasing uh, at a uh, dramatic pace. And there, of course, it's not only a security issue, which could be the case when you look just at uh, NSA, uh, but the loss of stolen data is personal data, and you have also a privacy problem. You even have a problem of consumer risks. Indeed, identity theft has for seven to eight years been um, at or near the top of list of consumer complaints in the developed industrialized countries. And security breaches are becoming, regrettably, commonplace. I could mention a couple of them. Uh, for instance, the uh, breach announced last month uh, here in the US with at least 70 million of consumers, customers of the so-called Target company, the third largest US retailer, of we, or we have the uh, three Korean credit card companies. Um, in that case, I think 20, almost 20 million people were affected. Uh, it's fair to say that concepts like trust are at stake when you see this kind of data security uh, breaches. So the question is then, how should we think about the current security risk environment? The day-to-day -day, uh, functioning, ladies and gentlemen, of business and government relies, in fact, on a complex, hyper-connected ICT environment in which security threats have changed both in scale and kind. And this is important. The scale has changed and the kind of uh, these uh, problems we are facing. As our economies have migrated massively online, so of course did the criminals and other malicious actors who have become sophisticated and very well organized, in most cases better organized than public authorities. And the threats extend even to the functioning of our critical infrastructure, 
infrastructures. Remember what I told you about the Internet of Things. And cybersecurity policies and measures aim to address these challenges and to establish the trust needed for economic activities to take place. But they must also recognize that um, security decisions can also inhibit, refrain economic and social development, reducing the capacity for innovation and productivity. We are at the OCD currently revising our 2002 security guidelines to help leaders of the G20 and the G8 to approach cybersecurity from an economic and social perspective. For government and business, it means um, moving this issue up from the IT department, where it is treated uh, most of the times now, to the real boardroom. The uh, cybersecurity, but not only the NSA case, the global cybersecurity issue has to become a leader's issue. Um, and of course, there will be a very important need to develop national cybersecurity strategies that foster economic prosperity while addressing privacy, consumer protection, property rights, uh, and so on. By the way, we are also working to improve the evidence base for policy making by means of a statistical manual to help computer security incident response teams, the so-called ICT fire brigades, that can then collect and share statistics in comparable uh, formats. And then there is the issue of privacy at its own. Personal data flows and uses are, of course, central to the internet economy, to the internet as an engine for trade, for consumption, uh, for the whole of the economy. And getting personal data governance right is a key uh, challenge and is a key challenge of growing importance given the um, trust which is uh, the people's trust which is challenged. Well, in that field, one of the few privacy good news stories from 2013, besides the NSA case and besides the data uh, breaches, was the successful revision of the privacy guidelines which apply worldwide, which is another cornerstone of the trust framework and one that underpins lots of national legislations around the world. The revisions of the uh, privacy guidelines were already started up before, of course, uh, NSA and other cases, and were motivated by a vast change of scale, change of scale in the volume and value of personal data, the so-called data deluge, where it is very obvious that the response, that the way public authorities should address these problems of privacy, for instance, dramatically change when you see the number and the value, the economic value which is attached to these uh, data. That change of scale is addressed in the revised guidelines um, in part through new concepts like the risk management, data breach, notification, global interoperability, and national privacy strategies. And the work on privacy uh, continues. We are now revisiting the core of privacy principles in the context of a, a project on big uh, data. Very important to underline here, I think, is uh, two things. Uh, based on the research we've done at the OECD, I can say first that the idea of building up, and sometimes in um, meetings with politicians and with diplomats, we, we hear the, the endeavor to try to build up a kind of sheriff for the Wild West, a kind of global authority, which would tackle all security uh, issues. We tend to believe that given the spread, the functioning, the characteristics of Internet, did this, and also the different approaches uh, national, uh, well, um, nations have towards the Internet and towards the value of Internet, the values also they share, well, that this is uh, really uh, impossible. And we think that um, it, the best way is to uh, try to better use the existing enforcement authorities, try to improve their cooperation, the one with the other uh, on cross-border cases. We started uh, consumers, we started uh, um, the, the drafting of recommendations in that field. But so the idea of a global enforcer, a kind of sheriff for the whole of the world to uh, look upon what's happening on the internet, we think may have superficial appeal, but empowering existing authorities to better work together is far more practical. Um, and we have been primarily focusing our work on authorities with civil 
administrative powers in opposition to the more judiciary and the criminal authorities. On the criminal front, cooperation against cybercrime takes place under the Council of Europe Budapest Convention. Not to underestimate, uh, we think it's the only real uh, applied convention in the framework of, at this very moment, in the framework of transatlantic relations, besides, of course, the mutual legal assistance treaties negotiated on a bilateral uh, basis. So there is room for improvement in this kind of cooperation, but starting negotiations about um, having one big authority which would have a global impact, an impact on the uh, whole of the world and the internet in the whole of the world is, we think, um, is wrong, is, is not feasible, is not realistic. The second thing I would like to underline is that uh, there is a kind of conflict between the European concept of uh, data protection, privacy, and the more global approach. Um, the European approach is a very uh, legal uh, approach where data protection is uh, perceived uh, and is also enforced as a kind of fundamental right. Every European, cit European citizen, citizen of European Union, for instance, has the right of, of data protection is a fundamental right. Uh, other uh, economic blocs tend to work more on a risk-based uh, approach. Um, and we think that uh, risk management, given the scale, and given the volume of activities we are uh, uh, facing now, that risk management is uh, a better approach. Risk management, of course, does not substitute for legal compliance, but um, we think that privacy implementation as of today cannot be left uh, to lawyers alone. There is a lot of policy work uh, to do, and we think that given the, um, uh, given the spread of internet and its functioning, this kind of risk management could be more effective for the uh, most important part of our citizens than the um, uh, work uh, based on the data protection as a fundamental uh, right. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by putting forward to you a broader policy approach to the internet uh, to help ensure that we achieve our shared public policy objectives. Um, we, of course, want to avoid slipping into the Wild West, but likewise, we must not stifle the dynamism and innovation we have seen in cyberspace over the last decade. So it's taming without restraining. And so cybersecurity and privacy are two of the key components of a broader framework for policy making agreed at the global level uh, when we adopted the principles for internet policy making, principles which reflect a consensus uh, amongst uh, nearly 40 of the leading economies in the world uh, and go well beyond the trust agenda that has been the primary focus uh, today. Uh, very important also, these um, uh, principles are a result of this multi-stakeholder consultation what is very important because the multi-stakeholder governance has up to now been the characteristic of the internet and been one of the tools, one of the trumps of this uh, system. These principles score for maintaining an open internet because it's uh, our collective experience that the key to unleashing innovation, creativity and economic growth lies with openness in a broad sense. So okay for more control, okay for more monitoring, okay for risk management, but please let's uh, uh, keep in mind that an open internet, an internet is not an internet without this open uh, character, without this decentralized uh, nature, uh, which uh, makes possible uh, lots of flourishing activities without the need for international regulation or treaties. An open internet provides the platform to, to innovation, to build a knowledge base, uh, and of course, there are still some problems with developing countries, but uh, we, uh, our advice is that uh, leaders, when they engage in talks to uh, try to strengthen some regulations they uh, perceive as being not tough enough uh, to face the problems, that they don't forget, uh, that they keep in mind that this openness of the Internet is really uh, crucial. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, it's about taming and uh, not too much uh, restraining uh, the internet. It is essential to keep the internet as an en engine of economic growth. Um, having one single regulator which is in charge of 
overlooking all what's happening on the internet worldwide and, um, and enforce uh, new regulation, we think is not a realistic uh, approach. We think that an approach based on risk management, um, which is more a policy issue than a regulatory issue, is more uh, effective. Um, and to uh, add a last footnote, I think, and this is maybe quite provocative for the uh, panel that will follow, we think, we tend to think that uh, cases like NSA, uh, all which was put in evidence uh, since uh, a couple of months or since a year, well, this is um, acting against legislation and still it has happened. So uh, this proves that the need is not for more, uh, well, the primary need is not for more regulation, but is, uh, it is all about trust. It is about um, enforcing existing legislation and about management of risks. Thank you very much.